Welcome to Haystacks in Hell, an ex-Adventist podcast where we tell stories about growing up Seventh-day Adventist, leaving faith behind, and building new, fulfilling lives. Just a quick content warning, this episode covers mature topics and mentions abuse. What age did you learn what sex was? I was in the third grade, and I was at lunch, and my best friend in third grade told me all about sex, except that she called it humping. <laughs> <laughs> I don't rightly recall. It wasn't exactly something that was hidden from me. Like, I remember watching, like, the Beastmaster and stuff when I was a kid, <laughs> and, like, there are nude scenes in there. I want to say, like, it was in fourth or fifth grade. My mom was super excited because she felt like, I'm going to share this with my daughter and it's going to be this beautiful experience about explaining how babies are made and how sex is. I guess guess the specifics, the ins and outs, if you will, I learned from penthouse letters that I found in the woods. Welcome back to Haystacks in Hell. I'm your host, Santiago, and today we're going to talk about an important topic. It's one that the SDA church and most religions are pretty obsessed with. We're talking about sex. For any parents or other folks who are interested, there are links in the show notes to inclusive sex education resources for kids, teens, and adults. Before I forget, make sure to follow the show by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Links to this and more are also in the show notes. Okay, so later in this episode, you'll hear Abby mention that many of Ellen White and the SDA Church's attitudes towards sex came from a man named John Harvey Kellogg. So learning about Kellogg gives us some very important context for the way the Adventist Church viewed sex and how this history still plays out in some of their views today. If you didn't already know, Kellogg was a Seventh-day Adventist, And yes, he helped invent Kellogg's cornflakes. He was born on February 26, 1852, in the U.S. state of Michigan. And his parents actually knew Ellen and James White and helped convince the Whites to move to Battle Creek, Michigan, where Kellogg would eventually manage the Battle Creek Sanitarium until he died in 1943. And I want you to keep this in mind as we go along. 1943 was only 80 years ago, and while that might sound like a long time, in reality, that's just about one lifetime. My grandma was born before then, and she's still alive. At age 12, Kellogg started working for James and Ellen White. He started out running errands for them, and by 16, he was doing proofreading and editorial work for The Review and Herald, which is an Adventist publishing company. He got very close to the Whites, even living with them for months at a time, and essentially became their protege. Reflecting on this years later, Ellen White actually said that James White had been more of a father to Kellogg than to his own sons. Kellogg really bought into the Adventist health message, and became a committed vegetarian, and also became a doctor with support from Ellen and James White. About a year after graduating from medical school, Kellogg became the superintendent of a health institution established by the SDA Church, which he later renamed as the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Over time, Kellogg became a sort of celebrity doctor. His patients included several U.S. presidents, abolitionist Sojourner Truth, pilot Amelia Earhart, inventor Thomas Edison, and car magnate Henry Ford. But Kellogg held many harmful and extreme views. He was the co-founder of the Race Betterment Foundation, an organization that promoted eugenics and racial segregation, and he believed that immigrants and non-whites would supposedly damage the nation's gene pool. He also performed genital mutilation without painkillers to prevent masturbation, because he believed that masturbating was not only sinful, but also caused epilepsy, uterine cancer, insanity, and much more. Because of his wild beliefs about masturbation, it was his mission to get people to stop at all costs. 
he had a bunch of unscientific recommendations like sticking to a bland, unstimulating diet and avoiding soft beds and pillows. Quoting Kellogg, Soft beds and pillows must be carefully avoided. The floor with a single folded blanket beneath the sleeper would be preferable. Concerning food, Kellogg said, Tea and coffee have led thousands to perdition in this way. Candies, spices, cinnamon, cloves, peppermint, and all strong essences powerfully excite the genital organs and lead to the same result. He also wrote that, quote, flesh, condiments, eggs, tea, coffee, chocolate, and all stimulants have a powerful influence directly upon the reproductive organs. They increase the local supply of blood, and through nervous sympathy with the brain, the passions are aroused. Kellogg wasn't the first or only one spreading these wild ideas. He was actually inspired by another extremist named Sylvester Graham, who was born 50 years earlier. Graham was an evangelical preacher and played a role in the temperance movement of the 1830s. He had similarly extreme and unscientific views on sex and masturbating, claiming that masturbation, or self-pollution as some called it, could lead to insanity. Like Kellogg, Graham was also a vegetarian and was very much against spices, insisting that eating a bland diet was really important. He believed this so much that he developed his own process for making whole wheat flour, which eventually led to the graham cracker. But graham crackers back then were nothing like the sweet graham crackers we have today and use for s'mores. He would be rolling in his grave if he knew what they became, because his original flour was intentionally dull and bland. And the whole story about Sylvester Graham is actually pretty wild, so if you want to know more about this, the Dark History Podcast has a great episode which I've linked in the show notes. While Kellogg's cornflakes were not explicitly advertised as helping people control their sexual urges, this was arguably one of John Harvey Kellogg's motivating factors behind much of his work. Kellogg was inspired by Graham and others with extreme puritanical ideas, and there are many claims that graham crackers were in fact originally intended to discourage masturbation. Now, you might be wondering, why all of this obsession with sex and masturbation? First off, sexual restriction is a concept that's culturally universal. As we discussed in episode 3, human beliefs about big, moralizing gods evolved over time as our societies grew and got more and more complex. The Abrahamic religions like Judaism, Islam, and Christianity have historically promoted and tried to enforce a patriarchal and heteronormative standard for human sexuality. We'll talk more about patriarchal systems in the future, but for now, I want to share a definition by the late feminist historian Carol P. Christ. Quote, Patriarchy is a system of male dominance, rooted in the ethos of war, which legitimizes violence, sanctified by religious symbols, in which men dominate women through the control of female sexuality, with the intent of passing property to male heirs, and in which men who are heroes of war are told to kill men and are permitted to rape women, to seize land and treasures, to exploit resources, and to own or otherwise dominate conquered people. Now, if you're a guy or you have never really identified with feminism in general, you may find this definition to be pretty harsh. But bear with me for a second, because if you've read the Bible, you can easily recognize these themes in Christianity. Deuteronomy 21 verses 10 to 14, literally provide instructions for how to treat women captured in war. It gives permission to men to take them as wives and have sex with them. There's no mention of consent anywhere in that passage. Even to this day, some Christians reject the concept of consent 
and believe that if you're married, it's not possible to rape your spouse. Before the 1970s, spousal rape was actually legal in the entire United States. But of course, we know from experience that religions don't just try to control women's sexuality, they try to control everyone's sexuality. And that's definitely true within the Adventist church. Another piece of helpful context to understand this comes from the BITE model of authoritarian control. BITE stands for Behavior, Information, Thought, and Emotional Control, and this model was created to help describe the specific methods that cults use to recruit and maintain control over people. And when you read the first three points of behavior control methods, they are 1. Regulate an individual's physical reality. 2. Dictate where, how, and with whom the member lives and associates or isolates. And 3 when, how, and with whom the member has sex. In a bit, we're going to cover how people like Graham, Kellogg, and Ellen White tried to control when, how, and with whom people had sex and the ridiculous justifications they gave for that. Besides considering it sinful, Graham, Kellogg, and Ellen White also believed that too many orgasms would literally shorten your lifespan and could even kill you. So with all that context, it's easier to understand why Ellen White would make wild comparisons about people who masturbate, saying they, quote, are just as surely self-murderers as though they pointed a pistol to their own breast and destroyed their life instantly. You'll hear Abby talk more about this later, but I couldn't help but share a little bit more about what Graham and Kellogg believed. Graham falsely claimed that the loss of an ounce of semen was equivalent to the loss of several ounces of blood. He also instructed married couples to have sex only to have kids and that they should limit sex to no more than once a month. Kellogg, quoting another doctor, wrote, I hold as certain that after 50 years of age, a man of sense ought to renounce the pleasures of love. Each time that he allows himself this gratification is a pellet of earth thrown upon his coffin. As far as we know, these guys actually practiced what they preached. It's widely believed that Kellogg never had sex with his wife during their 40-year marriage, and he and his wife actually slept in separate bedrooms and adopted all eight of their children. And while there's no authoritative evidence of this, some people believe that Kellogg may have been asexual. In other words, he had little to no sexual feelings or desires. And I want to be clear, his wild views and desire to control other people's sexuality have nothing to do with being asexual. I'd actually argue that Kellogg was more of a sadist than anything else, because even if he thought he was helping people live longer lives, he went as far as to perform male circumcision without painkillers to intentionally inflict pain. And he also performed female genital mutilation, pouring carbonic acid on the clitoris. He also recommended completely removing the clitoris as a last resort. If you're curious to learn more about Kellogg's wild beliefs, he wrote a book called Plain Facts for Old and Young, which is linked in the show notes and you can read for free online. Now, when you look at current Adventist and evangelical Christian views on sex and masturbation, it's possible to see how they trace back to the incredibly dark, twisted, and unscientific beliefs held by men like Graham and Kellogg. But of course, like everything else, these beliefs have evolved over time, so to ensure I'm accurately representing the official views of the SDA Church, I went on their website again, quoting from their page on sexual behavior, sexual practices which are contrary to God's expressed will are adultery and premarital sex, as well as obsessive sexual behavior, sexual abuse of spouses, sexual abuse of children, incest, 
homosexual practices, gay and lesbian, and bestiality are among the obvious perversions of God's original plan, end quote. Now, here we have a blatantly homophobic statement comparing non-heterosexual sex to sexual abuse, incest, and bestiality. This is an official statement of the SDA Church that was approved and voted on by the General Conference Executive Committee in 1987 under the leadership of General Conference President Neil Wilson. And even though it's 2023, this attitude hasn't really changed under the leadership of his son, Ted Wilson. Hooray for nepotism, I guess. But as I've mentioned before, Adventism is not a monolith. You'll find that modern Adventists have many different beliefs about sexuality and topics like sexual orientation. Some individual churches in Europe have even partnered with SDA Kinship, a community by and for LGBTQ plus people who are current or former Seventh-day Adventists, as well as for their families. But sadly, this seems to be the exception, not the rule. Years ago, when I was in middle school or just entering high school, I remember the pastor's kid at my old church telling me that it is biblically moral and justifiable to kill gay people, even if it isn't legal. I was shocked when I heard that, and I'm ashamed to admit I completely forgot about that conversation until years later when I started deconstructing my faith. Now, I'm a straight cis man. I haven't had to deal with a fraction of the bullshit that women and LGBTQ plus people have had to deal with. And I'm also ashamed to admit that in high school, I was opposed to gay marriage, even getting into Facebook comment arguments with more liberal Adventists. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a future episode. Before we play Abby and Amy's episode, I figured I'd share a bit of my own experience. I did learn about the differences between boys and girls at a very young age by literally playing doctor with the daughter of another Adventist who was babysitting me. I can vaguely remember us playing with her toy stethoscope and syringe and just exploring each other. She was just slightly older than me. I think we were both around three or four, and we were just curious kids. Of course, this wasn't anything bad. It was just completely normal behavior for two kids. But by then, we knew enough about social norms that we hid what we were doing from her mom. So early on, we both had the idea that what we were doing wasn't exactly going to be okay with our parents, and we needed to do it in secret. I don't remember exactly when I learned what sex was, but I do remember learning about masturbation at the Adventist school I attended, either in elementary or middle school. I had been homeschooled before going there, and I really gave off this naive vibe, because I was a naive kid. So this guy in the grade above me explained what masturbation was, and I'm pretty sure that he thought it would be hilarious to explain it to me because I was a naive kid. I remember that same day when I learned about it, I went home and tried it, and again, from day one, this was something automatically tied to secrecy. I don't immediately remember associating a ton of shame with it, but the shame definitely came later, and I'll talk more about that in the next episode. Again, the shame and aspects of purity culture that most straight guys are subjected to usually pales in comparison to what everyone else experiences. Even having little or no sexual desire at all can be seen as a problem in the church. I remember hearing people at church and also reading comments online about how humans were commanded by God to be fruitful and multiply, but it's entirely possible and valid to want to be single or to not have kids. While there's no way of knowing for sure, both Jesus and Paul actually seem to talk about asexuality in Matthew 19 verse 12 and 1 Corinthians 7. Either way, I think something that many people who grew up Adventist or Christian have in common 
is the general sense of secrecy or embarrassment around the topic of sex. My parents never openly spoke about it. In fact, whenever something even remotely sexual came on TV, my mom insisted on fast-forwarding it if possible or just turning the TV off. I remember watching the movie Titanic with my dad, and my mom walked into the room right as the painting scene started playing, and she was not happy. While my parents did try to give me and my brother sex ed at home, it wasn't very helpful, and I'll talk more about this in the next episode. What I'll share for now is that I definitely did not have a formal sex education as part of my school experience. Everything I learned was directly from my parents and from people at my church as I got older. I did some learning on the side, which we'll get into more in the next episode, but some of the things I distinctly remember being taught were that masturbation was wrong because God intended sex to be between a man and a woman and not by yourself, that that was uh, basically short of the ideal standard. And I do remember one time attending a sex talk by someone who was an Adventist, and it was a bit awkward because there were parents and teenagers there, and some of the parents were asking questions as well. You'll hear Abby and Amy talk about this idea of oral sex and whether or not it's okay within Adventism. And again, Adventism is not a monolith. Different Adventists will give you different answers on this. The talk that I attended was somewhat liberal, I guess you could say. Definitely only considered sex within the context of heterosexual marriage to be okay. But this person who was giving this talk answered a question from a parent. It was a a dad who wanted to know if oral sex was okay. And the person giving the talk, who was a woman, said that it was. And let me tell you, to this day, I still remember seeing a big smile on that guy's face when she said that it was okay. It's almost like he won a bet with his wife or something. Anyway, I did want to share one final thought which I will also touch on more in a future episode, but I really wanted to mention it now since we're on the topic of sex. You should not feel ashamed or embarrassed about whatever level of sexual experience you have. As I was leaving the church in my mid-twenties, I was still a virgin and felt a bit embarrassed and anxious about that fact. And one thing I've come to learn over time is that The whole idea of virginity is a very heteronormative concept. This idea that you have to have penis and vagina sex in order to not be a virgin anymore is bullshit. And it excludes people who have no interest in that whatsoever. No matter how much or how little experience we've had, that is not something that we should feel ashamed about. And if you're someone who is nervous about dating and putting yourself out there because you don't have much experience, I want to encourage you to move at your own pace, but to also step outside of your comfort zone a little bit in a way that's safe and responsible if you're able to. It's something that I really had to work on as a young adult after I left the church, but it was so worth it, and it definitely can get better with time. Again, this is just one perspective, so if you have any stories you'd like to share, I'd love to hear them and amplify them. You can see the show notes for instructions on how to share. On that note, let's go ahead and play Abby and Amy's episode. Hello, this is Abby. And this is Amy. And so today is May 19, and we are going to talk about sex. Yay! (laughs) Oh, wait, we're talking about sex in terms of Adventism. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Or rather, ugh. This will not be our last episode about sex. We will probably cover the topic on multiple occasions. We but should we... probably get some boys in here to talk about it. We should probably get some people with different sexual orientations in here to talk about it. Yes. 
Anybody who was raised Adventist probably has a number of hair-raising stories on this topic. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) So we thought for our first episode, we would kind of give a broad overview of Adventist attitude towards sex, and then maybe a few personal stories. There's a very good article that I found years ago online that just walks through mostly John Harvey Kellogg's attitude towards sex, which strongly influenced Ellen White's writings. And it's actually difficult to understand her writings about it if you don't know his attitudes about it. So he was the physician that established a lot of the early Adventist health message. And he did have a lot of good ideas about like exercise and healthy diet. And like he was- he Cornflakes. This is the cornflakes, man. <laughs> This is breakfast cereal, man. What you probably don't realize is that breakfast cereal was supposed to be a bland food that would help people not masturbate. True story. (laughs) (laughs) So much in my life has been meant to stop me from masturbating. So this is the thing that you need to understand about Adventists and sex. Early Adventists believed that orgasms depleted your vital energy and that too many orgasms would kill you. So if you don't understand this, it's very difficult to parse Ellen White's writings on the topic. She talks at length about, for instance, marital excess. And I don't know about you. I don't know if Amy, like I read a lot of Ellen White. As a kid, I encountered these passages and was very confused because no one in my church ever talked about marital excess. People talked about Mm. adultery, fornication. No one talked about marital excess. So this was a confusing topic. And there were there's a lot of passages in there about how wives should not inflame the lust of their husbands. And it's just very confusing unless you understand that she believed sincerely that too many orgasms will kill you. So this is also the genesis of her extensive writings about masturbation. But it's important to realize she wasn't just picking on single people masturbating. She was against orgasms on a broad broad spectrum. <laughs> no, in some ways, Ellen White and I are very different people. <laughs> we'll hope that almost everyone is very different. I don't think it would be fair to say that she um, personally was against orgasms or some evidence that she enjoyed time with her husband. She just believes that you should really try hard to abstain because it's like too much sugar or, I don't know, too much booze. Of course, Adventists for any amount of booze is too much. But like, if you understand that, then you can understand the weird things that you read in Ellen White about sex. Adventist attitude towards sex is all informed by Ellen White. And even though they don't quote her, even though she isn't actively mentioned, you can see those attitudes seeping into Adventist educational systems, uh, Adventists, uh, you know, when they talk to their kids and, and sex education, like that's kind of the underlying thing that was never disavowed by the church, even if it's not actively believed and taught. So John Harvey Kellogg also believed that that you should do things like put acid on little girl's genitals if you find them masturbating, because that will make them stop. He made little penis cages for little boys. (laughs) <laughs> they believed that circumcision for little boys was desirable because it would hurt them and make them less likely to touch themselves. This is all like part of our Adventist heritage. Um, <laughs> and I think you're right that those things, which are exceedingly fucked up, uh, <laughs> I don't remember anyone ever quoting Ellen White to me about sex. Yeah. They quoted Ellen White to me about plenty of other things, like riding my bike on the Sabbath. <laughs> but they didn't ever... I don't remember anyone ever quoting Ellen White to me about sex. But it is that kind of, this is where we started. And it does inform some attitude. Some of that is so extreme that yeah. I know that there are people who are still Adventists who will listen and be like, that's not what Adventists believe yes. about sex. The, yes. That is not it's what... Not. It's modern not, Adventists believe no. about sex, but this idea that but sex it, is not necessarily bad in, you know, moderation, moderation <laughs> you know, that like sex is okay, but you don't want to get too into it. I think, I think it's still lot, kind of the attitude. Yeah. I think if you asked a lot of Adventists whether they believe there was anything wrong that you could do as a married couple sexually, a lot of Adventists would hesitate. Probably. Probably. 
if you even said, is there anything wrong you could do as a married couple without involving anything but your bodies? I think a lot of Adventists would still hesitate. I think so. I don't remember anyone ever talking to me about specific Mm -hmm. actions. (laughs) Oh, I do. (laughs) Well... (laughs) I do. No, I don't mean talking to you. I mean talking to me. <laughs> but I can... <laughs> Amy, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Amy, I had a serious talk with you about... <laughs> no, but I definitely... There was definitely an attitude that, like, anal sex would be pretty wrong regardless mm-hmm. of who was doing it. Mm-hmm. That that was definitely questionable behavior. Sodomy. Sodomy is definitely not, you know... Some of those things, though, are not just Adventist attitudes. They're Protestant American attitudes. Yes. Or they're, it's true. you know. It's true. And to be fair, Adventists were not the only people at the time when Kellogg was alive who believed wackadoo things about sex. Like, he wasn't just making these things up. He was getting it to a degree from the literature of his There's a lot of that generation. going around. Yeah. At the time. Mm-hmm. I think that the attitudes about sex that I internalized as a kid were mostly positive but like positive with these sort of weird like I said like sex is good just don't get too (laughs) crazy about it but I think my mom in particular was a lot more sex positive than Mm -hmm. a lot of people I knew at the time yeah I had no question that she and my dad had sex and that they enjoyed it and that it was something you know positive and good in their lives and she was very vocal about the idea that this that sex was good and was enjoyable within the right context which for her of course meant heterosexual marriage but still that's a valuable message that's a really valuable message i don't remember her ever talking about masturbating one way or another Mm -hmm. i don't remember her going on and on about too many things beyond just you know it's a good idea to wait till you get married yeah and we just sort of pretended like gay people did not really exist <laughs> you know <laughs> that just didn't that wasn't really part of the conversation that yeah. was yeah outside of the realm of possible options uh, available yes. to me. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah um but she did have i remember a talk specifically that was about how satan twists and turns bad all of these beautiful, wonderful gifts that God gives us. Mm -hmm. And sex is one of those wonderful gifts that is supposed to be really good and really positive and wonderful. And Satan makes it bad by, you know, tempting you to, I don't know, have premarital sex and then have your life ruined by (laughs) unwanted pregnancy or something. Yeah, I definitely got that, that message as well. My parents were, I mean, I I knew that they had sex. And I remember overhearing a conversation that I wasn't supposed to hear between my mother and a friend during which she confessed in a whisper that she enjoyed sex with her husband, my mother. And and that made me feel much better. Like I was probably four or five years old. I was relieved. I had been sort of... (laughs) I don't know. So maybe I was six. I don't know. I was I was fairly young, but I was I was glad to know this. Like, it, so many kids talk about the the icky response they feel when they when they learn you know that their parents have sex, and I remember feeling quite relieved. At the same time, I remember the moment when I learned what sex actually was, and I was. 12, and I know I was younger than 12 when I overheard this conversation. So I don't think I actually knew what it was. Exactly. It was, you know, it was what parents did to make babies, and it, it was not something that was abhorrent to my mother. And so that, that was good. <laughs> that was a good thing. That's kind of a funny thing that maybe encapsulates what I think of as sort of the overriding Adventist attitude towards sex, which is, on the one hand, there's this, like, relief and this good positive, you know, that, like, oh, good, sex is enjoyable. <laughs> But on the other hand, you had to learn that by overhearing your mom embarrassed and whispering to her friend that sex is enjoyable. So, like, sex is good, but not really good to talk about, not really good to let on that you like it, (laughs) Um, only good in certain situations, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. only, I I don't know. That's a weird, do you hear, dear listener, the weird sort of push and pull that you've got there of, like, it's good, but 
don't act like it's too good. <laughs> it's surrounded with contradictions and inconsistencies. So um, I, I remember another conversation with my mother when I was probably 14-ish, maybe 15. And I had somehow gotten all the way to the ripe age of mid-teens without receiving the memo that oral sex was very wrong. And I... <laughs> And I, uh, I can't remember, my mother and I do not talk about sex very often at all, so I can't remember the context in which this came up, but I said something about the concept of oral sex in the context of marriage, and my mother just looked at me with this expression of absolute horror and said, we are not to behave like animals. <laughs> and... <laughs> And wow. I was I was bowled over because I really had somehow gotten the idea. I knew that sex toys were probably wrong. Kinky stuff was definitely wrong. But I had somehow gotten the idea that anything that you could do with your two bodies as married people would be acceptable. And um, I was... You're debasing yourself. I was so confused by this. And uh, confused enough that my embarrassment sort of dropped away. And I sort of quizzed her on this because... I was confused and fascinated, and I kind of knew, I also knew that I didn't agree, even though I had very little context to base this on. <laughs> and um, my mother just got more and more flustered trying to explain why it would be... Why it would be wrong or... It would be terribly wrong. She didn't use the word sodomy, which might have cleared it up for me, because... At that time, it's I don't know when Florida sodomy laws got repealed. Uh, it was extremely recently, yeah, like within the last ten years. So at that time, it was probably illegal to have oral sex. Um, um, a lot of people don't realize that sodomy laws just mean that anything other than penis and vagina intercourse is illegal. It doesn't matter whether you're gay, straight, married, unmarried. Strict sodomy laws mean that anything that can't make a baby is illegal sexual activity. Georgia <laughs> overturned their sodomy laws before Florida overturned theirs. And mm -hmm. I remember when Georgia did because of conversations that people were having about like, oh, I'm making a trip to Atlanta, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and so games, that was folks. probably like when I was in college, maybe 12 years ago. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And Florida's, I think, were overturned a little while after that. Yeah. So, yeah, when you were 15, oral sex was certainly illegal, illegal in Florida. illegal in the state of Florida. And if my mother had said that, me being the... I, I tried to be a, a law-abiding creature, but I was also a very logical person. And so nothing she was saying about we must not behave like animals made any sense to me, partially because I knew the animals mostly mated to have babies and so mating for pleasure seemed to me like a very human thing and so I was confused. <laughs> By the time you and I were of an age to be learning about all of this stuff mm -hmm. we'd moved away from the idea that sex is purely for procreation yeah. but there was still kind of that you know that is still kind of the base of the attitude that anything that is too pleasurable is mm -hmm. suspect you know yeah. like and that's kind of a that's a very puritanical view yes. that not only Adventists have, but that a lot of, like, why is masturbating wrong? Yeah. Well, because you're not supposed to be able to just have fun whenever you want to. Yeah, make a baby. You know, just because yeah. you feel like it and you're bored. <laughs> pleasure um, is suspect. Pleasure, pleasure is bad. suspect. Mm -hmm. Why is oral sex wrong? Well, because that is, you know, pleasurable and there's no, you know, there's no consequence in some ways. Which means female so orgasms in general are... Female orgasms in general kind of are wrong. suspect. Yeah, because, because you don't have to have that to make a baby. Men have to. Yeah. Ladies don't. One of my friends in college once made the comment that, yeah, in Adventist land, men have orgasms, women have babies. No. <laughs> I don't think that's just in Adventist land, but I do think that that is... Uh, an attitude. An attitude. Which is kind of a shame. There's also that idea that like so awful. boys masturbate and that's just sort of a fact of yeah. life. It's yeah. wrong and you shouldn't do it and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. But, you know, but that's just a thing that happens and can't really be avoided. Mm -hmm. But girls masturbating is like, what? <laughs> so, yeah. So I was I was a little kid who masturbated. I was um, 
very, very young when I figured out how my body worked. I, I don't remember figuring out how it worked. I, I remember knowing how it worked from a very young age. I did not connect it with sex at all. I thought it was a superpower that I had. I was very disappointed when I learned that it was not a superpower, but something that made Jesus cry. <laughs> um, and, you know, about age six or so, my my guilt and fear with my body began when I when I finally figured out that this this neat thing my body did was this other hideous thing that I had heard mentioned before, but these two things were the same. I remember when I was probably also in my teens, maybe early 20s, I couldn't talk to anybody about this. Like if you were a boy, you could talk to people about this because that was a problem you were supposed to have. But as a girl, you weren't. And I remember going to the ABC and finding this book that was supposed to be, <laughs> it was supposed to help boys get a handle on their masturbation issues which in retrospect, I didn't have issues. I had a completely normal teenage female libido, but whatever. So I, I wanted assistance with this. And I got this book and, and was reading it. And I was just so disappointed because there was nothing useful in it. Absolutely nothing useful. I, there was a lot of like really nebulous nonsense. I wanted specifics. Basically, I believed that I was not supposed to be a sexual person until I got married. And I wanted some sort of assistance in turning off my sexuality until I, you know. You wanted the like home remedy for stopping your kid from sucking their thumb. Exactly. That's like, what I wanted. And it was just completely useless. It had dumb advice like don't be alone. Don't... I can't even remember all the advice. Like it, it was just... Mostly it was pep talk after pep talk and yeah. then like really ridiculous you know make sure you keep your hands outside the sheets when you sleep at night or just, just like <laughs> ridiculous, useless, utterly useless. And I remember being very disappointed um, because I had uh, gone out on a limb to, to buy, you know, it was already difficult to find a point when I can buy this book when nobody would see me. And then like, it was completely. Oh, probably if somebody useless. had seen you with this book, they would have thought you were reading it out of some fascination with boys and their probably. genitals. And that probably. would have been really. <laughs> Even more embarrassing. Totally inappropriate. I remember, since we're on the topic of masturbating, I didn't yeah. figure out masturbating until I was much older. I think everybody just sort of has a different, well, a different level of sex drive and also a different... Maybe lucky, because the guilt and fear that's associated with that in the Adventist church is just an endless cycle. Like, I do have memories of some very kind of non-specific, like, oh, when I do this thing, it feels good. But nothing mm. that, not any, like, purposeful, yeah. like, I have this goal yeah, of yeah. orgasm uh -huh. in mind or something uh -huh. until I was a lot older. But I remember a guy that I went out with. I was going to say dated, but I was an Adventist kid, so we didn't really date. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other topic. I've never heard that distinction before, but that's... No, but you sense. know, right? Like, uh -huh. like yeah. wait, you don't go on a date. You, like, uh -uh. get pre-engaged almost. <laughs> I mean, you're like... Uh, you, you hold, hold hands, hands with somebody in chapel, and then you are boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> um, this kid was my boyfriend, and he confessed to me very, like, almost tearfully, like, it was a big deal to him that he confessed to me that he masturbated. And, you know, I mean... And that's like, the way I felt about it. If I had confessed that to you, it would have been the same sort of traumatic, He was, like, I mean, incredibly embarrassed. And I'm sure that this was a really difficult and painful thing for yeah. him to tell another uh -huh. person, much less somebody uh -huh. that he, you know liked and was hoped to know, get his penis in someday yeah definitely you know wanted to feel my boobs <laughs> but uh <laughs> he was so embarrassed and it was clearly this great source of shame and i mean it huh. was a looking back on it this is one of my few genuine regrets in life and i mean this sincerely i'm not yeah. poking fun yeah my response was just one of utter bafflement and i was like why <laughs> why why would you do that <laughs> I don't, this is obviously a problem. And I mean, I don't remember how the conversation progressed, yeah, but it was yeah. just like, oh no, like what, what are we going to do about this? Why would you do this broken. thing? I guess you have this great cross to bear and challenge in your life. And I regret that so deeply. I wish that he had said, I masturbate and that I had laughed yeah. and said, dude, of course you do. Uh -huh. You're like a 16 year old boy. Like mm -hmm. this is just, uh -huh. please enjoy. And, <laughs> you know, 
Anyway, I I sincerely wish that I had had the life experience. Yeah. If I could like transport back into my younger self for like 15 minutes, <laughs> that's where I would go. He'd be like, I masturbate. And I would be like, let me explain to you why that is not a problem. And hopefully fix you for the future. Like, let's get you a jump start on a healthy attitude towards mm-hmm. sex mm-hmm. that you probably, you know, had to work to get. <laughs> As an adult, I know I did. <laughs> Hindsight is twenty twenty. So. Oh, like I said, I know that we're laughing about this. It's a silly thing that I feel. You know, I'm not telling this story to poke fun at yeah. this person. I sincerely wish that I had had better attitudes and better information to give this kid. Who, when I look back on it, of all the things you have to worry about in high school, mm-hmm. what a stupid thing to have like eating you up inside yeah. that you feel like you're making this terrible mistake. Yeah. You're making Jesus sad every time you. <laughs> Do a perfectly natural and (laughs) healthy thing. Yeah. Masturbating. There's no downside to it. There really isn't. There's none. You can't get diseases now. You can't get diseases. You can't get pregnant. You learn about your body and what you enjoy. It helps with stress. You're more likely to have positive relationships with partners later because you understand your body and you understand what is Mm -hmm. going to be pleasing to you. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think what we're trying to say, guys, is touch Perfect. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. all of the, the literature is unanimously positive, particularly for women, because women do sometimes have trouble. Like, if you know how your body works, you can show a partner how it works. If you don't know how it works, it's kind of hard to show a partner how it works. Well, guys are fairly easy. There's pretty, you know, it pretty much works one way. Um, um, that's not entirely been true, more guys but than you, I'm going to say that's but, not true. <laughs> w- there are plenty of women who have, you know, who orgasm in only particular yeah. ways. And so you that should figure out one, what those ways are. That is the one downside to masturbating is if you if you are extremely consistent in the way that you do it, you can have trouble getting off any other way. So, you know, vary your routine. <laughs> There. <laughs> um, I, I was going to say, uh, bringing it back to uh, to Adventism, if you read the Adventist literature, uh, you will discover that masturbation causes cancer and blindness and epilepsy and, oh gosh, pretty much any disease known to man is caused by masturbating. And Mrs. White, I believe, masturbated because unlike my unhelpful book from the ABC, she has quite a bit to say about girls masturbating, which I think is very interesting for a woman writing in the 1800s. So, um, you know, that was both solace and consternation to me as a young woman because she did have things to say about it. Nobody else did. But, you know, it was all negative and moral decay and (laughs) um, just also patently ridiculous things. This was one of the issues that began to break my faith was, especially as a medical professional, there was no way I could talk myself into believing some of the things that she claimed were the results of masturbation. That This and some of the things she says about black people were the first things that I read in there and was just like, in college, it was just like, I, th- this, this is, this is just beyond the pale. I can't, yeah. <laughs> I can't. A thread to start pulling on. This is a thread to start pulling yeah. on. I don't know. Did that kind of stuff contribute at all to your faith um, unraveling or? Um, when I started to think more logically about homosexuality, that mm-hmm. was definitely mm-hmm. a thing to me that, um, wait, why is this? considered to be a sin and why is this ironically ellen white has very little to say about homosexuality she was too busy telling straight people to stop having sex (laughs) (laughs) um so a little bit i mean i don't think that sex wasn't a breaking point for me with uh with that but you know i also got married pretty young and uh you know to another Adventist who was soon to be another former Adventist. So I guess my experience was different from some people's. I think that if I had been a single adult Mm -hmm. longer, maybe my attitudes would have, I would have had a different experience because I would have, you know, had to figure some of these things out and how they fit in actual 
contemporary life. And I'm 37 and have never been married. So, you know, that was one of the things that you're sort of taught growing up in the Adventist church is that you're saving yourself for marriage and that eventually God will send you someone that you can have <laughs> sex with. So if that doesn't happen, you're, you're, you're in this really awkward place where you're, you're proud of your virginity. You're proud of it. You're proud of it. Oh my God. And now it's a, this is a horrible burden and I'm so embarrassed by it. Like get this away from me. (laughs) Um, We can talk about that another time, but most people in our parents' generation got married in their early twenties. I think Uh, you did as well. Most of the other people in our generation did not, however. Yeah. So definitely my experience was a little bit, a little bit different. It's like we said, it's hard to parse just American society's Mm -hmm. screwed up attitudes Mm -hmm. about sex from religious screwed up attitudes about sex and then Adventism to parse that out even further. Yeah. And then to figure out like, well, what was, what did I learn from my Adventist upbringing versus what I learned from the larger culture or what I learned from my like specific individuals attitudes about sex. Mm -hmm. My mom's attitude Mm -hmm. is one that was extremely influential to me, but I don't think that her attitude was necessarily right in line with Adventist teaching. So that's a little bit hard. I have tried to sort of compare in some ways, like how I learned about sex to the way my daughter is learning about Mm -hmm. sex. Mm -hmm. Um, And she's definitely learning about it in a different way from me. I mean, I think that, I never feel like my parents were particularly secretive about it, but she is definitely able to ask questions that I was never comfortable to ask. There is an underlying squeamishness that she, I don't think is getting. Yeah. You know, that's great. She was really delighted recently. I read a poem to one of my friends and the poem is talking about sex is one of the things as this woman is talking about a man and Alice overheard me reading the poem. And when I stopped, she goes, she's talking about sex in that poem. And I'm like, yes, she is. And some parts of it she is. And she goes in a lot of it, (laughs) but she has this sort of delight. Like she's caught a reference to something, you know, like, she was so pleased with herself for understanding <laughs> that this poem was about sex. And I was like, well, you know, she's talking about someone that she loves, somebody that she knows very well. And, you know, sex is one of the ways that we can love each other as humans. And she's like, yeah, it's one of the ways that we know about each other. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, cool. Like, I- I'm ha- I'm comfortable with the attitude that she's learning, but... It's not the same as yeah. That's awesome. How I got it when I was over at your house when Alice was younger. You know, sex comes up and the yeah. topics on Friday. Our night. friends talk about sex pretty openly. Yeah, and I never remember you being like, "Oh, you need to censor yourself." No, we Alice never. In the room. We never censored any. We don't get super graphic no. in front of the kid or something. But They're not like filthy conversations or like nasty sexual references that are like no, not like but just gross matter sex fact. jokes or something. But yeah, like no, not like that at know. all. But matter of fact, yeah, mentionings of sex are often in the context of like talking about a novel or a movie or something. Yeah, I never that was not a kind of conversation <laughs> that my parents and their friends ever had in front of me. I can remember like you know when there was like a makeout scene in a movie. And kind of the <laughs> awkward tension in the room or something. Closure, I was incredibly, it was the most horrible thing. Or like a really, I don't know, a sexual joke or something. Yeah. That you knew that your parents wanted to laugh at it. Uh-huh. Like looking back, they had to have thought it was funny. Awkward. Yeah. So awkward. Oh no, there's boobs in this movie. <laughs> what will we do? Adventists are so uncomfortable with the concept of sex that there's not even a clear party line on it. Yeah. I mean, my parents said, so my parents felt pretty progressive because when they went to Southern, there was a professor there who bragged in the theology department who bragged that he had two children and he'd only ever had sex twice. That he and his wife never had sex except for procreation. They've been successful, you know, at knocking these two guys, two kids out. 
You know, and they never had to deal with that mm-hmm. unpleasantness again. Exactly, exactly. And I hope for her sake that she had no libido because what a horrible marriage. And my parents, you know, felt progressive since they felt like penis and vagina intercourse for pleasure and marriage was okay. Like that seemed like a really yeah <laughs> progressive idea to them. There was apparently lots of discussions about whether sex will on Sabbath was okay when they were in <laughs> Southern. And this was not something that I remember ever coming up. So like there has been forward motion. Like yeah. there has been progress, but it's so slow and kind of depressing. We'll have to get Alex in here and we'll talk about the, uh, sex video that we were required to watch before we got married. (laughs) That one's a gem. (laughs) That's special. You think we could dig it up? Probably. On YouTube, maybe? Maybe. I will do some research and see if we can find it. I don't remember the names of any of the people involved, Uh but one couple that we know that's a bit younger than us, Mm -hmm. when they got married, they were required to watch (laughs) the same video. And they got married like 10 years after we did, And this video had to have been made in like the late 70s. (laughs) So they're still as recently as maybe, you know, five or six years ago, they were still passing around the same like 30 year old video. (laughs) So if we could track that down, that would be pretty special. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, that would be fantastic. That would be great. That would be fantastic. So send us your weird Adventist sex stories. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we'll have a call in number by now. If you would like to call we would, in. We would love to hear about especially things I think like uh, your Adventist sex education mm-hmm, would mm-hmm. be great because I think that's definitely something we should talk about later. We'll have a whole episode about, about that. sex education. We're trying very hard to keep this on topic as like from the, an Adventist perspective, but we do realize that it's next to impossible to, to perfectly tweeze out Adventist attitudes from the attitudes of the baby boomers in general and just like kind of sex negative America in general. Adventists are particularly sex negative of of all the cults that came into being at that point in time. They are, I mean, even the Mormons who are, I I feel weirder than we are, although (laughs) that's, you know, that's subjective. That's That's very subjective are not as blatantly sex negative as the Adventists. We're kind of special in that area. We will talk to you guys next week with more scintillating, (laughs) horrifying stories. What age did you learn what sex was? I don't rightly recall. It wasn't exactly something that was hidden from me. Like, I remember watching, like, The Beastmaster and stuff when I was a kid. (laughs) And, like, there are nude scenes in there. Um, I saw heavy metal when I was nine with my dad. And <laughs> so my parents were very kind of hippie and that was they're like, the human body's beautiful. You don't have to be ashamed of it. You know, dad got Playboys and I could see them and stuff like that. I think when I really got to talk though, and it's so silly, and I already kind of knew what it was, but I was reading this vampire story and like the protagonist found a way to kill vampire like he had a vampire lover and he found a way to kill her through disease so he contracted the disease and it passed through his semen and his blood and my mom read the story and she's like josh do you know what semen is and like i totally lied because i didn't want her to know that i did i said no and then i get this (laughs) very clinical explanation well you know when a man and a woman feel attracted to each other the man's penis gets hard and he puts it in her vagina <laughs> until he reaches climax. And it's very clinical, and I'm like, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> this is really gross. How old were you? I was like 11, maybe. And I had a somewhat okay idea before that. Although I did remember thinking, like, yeah, sperm that was transferred through kissing because I saw Luke was talking. And there's a scene there, like in the very early movie, where they kiss, and then there's a jump cut to sperm going to the egg. And like, I didn't have the wherewithal to put the, like, the fill in the missing pieces. So I'm like, oh, they kiss, and that's and how then it And there's baby. Mm-hmm. So I'd say definitely by 11, <laughs> if I not think earlier. It, similarly for me, I think I was probably about 10. And when they actually sat there in, 
you know, the fifth grade class and we're like, this is the mechanics of intercourse. This is what it is. It felt like some, I don't know that anyone had ever explained it to me like that before, but it felt like confirmation of something I yeah. knew already, not like a brand new idea that was like, what? Yeah, that that kind of summed up my experience too. Yeah. Except my parents, were my, my mom or dad, I can't remember who was telling me. And so it's really icky when it's your parents. <laughs> um, I want to say like I was in fourth or fifth grade, which I guess was like nine, 10, 11 ish age. My mom was super excited because she felt like I'm going to share this with my daughter and it's going to be this beautiful experience about explaining how babies are made and how sex is. I mean, the one thing I can absolutely thank my mom for was that sex is a beautiful thing and it's something that happens and it doesn't have a whole lot of restriction to it. It wasn't like you had to be married or you had to do this. You just really had to love the person you were with. In her mind was a man, but you know, you really love the man that you're with and is an expression of your love. And it didn't have constraints on, like I said, like on being married or being whatever. So she was very adamant about, you need to know who you are and be comfortable with yourself to express that kind of love. So, I mean, I, I really could not ask for anything better. I was in the third grade and I was at lunch and my best friend in third grade was Michelle Davis. And she one day told me all about sex, except that she called it humping. <laughs> <laughs> and her facts were this. this. This is the truth according to Michelle Davis in the third grade. When men and women felt romantic feelings for each other, she specifically said a boy and a girl like each other. She did not mention being married or anything. Uh, they climbed on top of each other, they took off their clothes, and they made a thrusting motion, which she did to the great delight of everybody in the lunchroom. Uh, and she sort of like showed us, it, it looked like the movement to me in Greece during Greece Lightning, <laughs> where Danny Zuko is singing about what the car is gonna do to all the girls. It was that same movement. And that was humping. All you had to do, what was key here, as as I understood it, was the movement of like this like pelvic tilt, right? <laughs> I didn't understand anything about penetration. I was very confused. But I was like, oh my gosh, that's how, how babies are, are born. And so I went home and I was just so shell-shocked. Like everybody else was like, ooh, gross, that's awesome, whatever. I was like, I'm so shell-shocked. I was like very nervous and scared. And I told my mother everything. And my mom heard me out and listened to me. And then she went and got a book that she had bought a couple of years prior, just waiting for the moment that I would ask. <laughs> and the book was called How Babies Were Made. And that was really terrifying because it was a book that explained sex, but all the illustration illustrations inside the book were like paper cutouts. <laughs> <laughs> like stylized paper cutouts of how sex worked. So it started with plants and then it went to chickens and then it went to giraffes, mammals, and then it went to men and women. There was like these sort of construction paper, like cutout illustrations of like frontal view of like man and a woman with their clothes off. And then the representation of sex, that page just had the sheet in their bed were pulled up to their necks and they were like lying on top of each other. You could tell and they were kissing. You could see the back of the man's head and the woman just had this look of like just pure happiness on her face. Her <laughs> eyes were closed and she was smiling so big and she just looked so like sleepily content. And I was like, humpy. I did not because it did not, it explained penetration words, but it didn't give me the visual. I think that for a long time, I didn't really understand what penetration was. But I also remember after I read the book, I just burst into tears and my mom was like, what is wrong? And I'm like, this means you've seen dad naked. <laughs> and she was like, well, yeah, that's how you got here. And I was like, but you always tell me that boys and girls 
should never see each other naked. And you've done that, like, more than once. Because I have sisters. And, like, (laughs) you know, and my mom was like, well, yeah. My mom was really gracious and wonderful, but she, she did, like, say it over and over again, like, this is special between two people that are married, and I would hope that you would wait, and I hope that this would happen like this for you. And already I was sort of getting this, like, idea, and also there in the lunchroom with Michelle Davis, I was getting this idea as a little girl that there was something, I couldn't put my finger on it, but, like, something inherently shameful about it or liking it, so I was scared of it. And when my mom was like, well, yeah, me and dad have done this. And yeah, I see your dad naked. I was like, but you've always told me that's wrong. And now you're saying it's okay in this one sense. And it felt like I'd been lied to. And it felt like I didn't know what was really real. And it was very confusing. And so from that moment on, I was like very inquisitive. And just, I was like, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And I talked about sex with my mom all the time. Oh, I don't remember ever not knowing about it. I remember, you know, movies, television. I do remember... Uh, no, this is actually true, and I've told this story, I've got made fun of for this. I had pornography long before pubescence. You know what I mean? Like, before I was uh, masturbating, I had porn. And uh, I remember... <laughs> I figured out my own. I'm like, oh, that goes in that. Like, I remember that. I had, <laughs> From watching porn, I'm like, oh. Because it was like I had, like, softcore porn, maybe, then I found some hardcore porn kind of a thing. Older brother, you know how it is. And I went, oh, I get it now. You stick that thing in that thing. But I hadn't really thought about it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Never had to talk, all that kind of stuff. I don't, I didn't know what sex education was outside of, like, television. It was fun. Valentine's Day. I was 13 years old. <laughs> it's a true story. It's very romantic. First time I masturbated was Valentine's Day. <laughs> you're, you're such a romantic, John. It's been a lifelong romance, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Love affair. I found a, uh, a penthouse letters nice in the woods. That's good stuff. And it was, you know, I don't know, we had a house in a rural area, and there was a bunch of woods and sp- sporadically houses, all dirt roads. And, yeah, I, just, I would go exploring every day, and I found a penthouse letters. And so, you know, penthouse letters is obviously letters and some pictures... But mostly it was a lot of, just a lot of uh, sex letters. Yeah, it was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I don't remember specifically if that's when I learned about it, but I, I mean, that was my first experience with, like, the specifics, I guess. Yeah, I remember, like, trying to masturbate for some amount of time before I did. Oh, really? And not knowing how to do it. Because oh. I didn't know, like I said, that, oh, that goes in that, like, that epiphany a huge breakthrough for me in my life. And, you know, Playboy's not hardcore photography. You don't see that in there. And I had, like, you know, access at times in my life to satellite porn, which is always softcore with no penetration. Yeah, Skinamax. Like, but no, more, but it would be even like, like a Top Hat. Oh, if you remember Top Hat, it was a, anyway, <laughs> a old tiny satellite porn channel from back in the 80s. Um, that sounds fancy. Oh, yeah, that's all it was. It's called Top Hat. Basically, all they did was play XXX movies, but they would edit out all the scenes with penetration. So, yeah, like... Not knowing that was a little bit of a setback, but when I figured that out, it was... But I figured out my, for myself, it's kind of, I guess, the moral of the story. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess the specifics, <laughs> the ins and outs, if you will, mm-hmm. I learned from penthouse letters that I found in the woods. But boy, did I learn. Once I learned, oof. Up and running. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. Thanks for listening. If you have a story to share about your Adventist or fundamentalist experience, we'd love to hear it. You can submit stories on our website at hell.bio. That's H-E-L-L dot B-I-O. Or leave us a voicemail at 301-750-8648, and we might feature it in a future episode. Thanks to Abby and Amy for their original podcast audio, and thanks again for listening. We'll see you on the next one.